Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman and I am your host. And my guest today is Stephen Besserman. He is a documentary storyteller. He is chief storyteller of Ari Joe Productions. He has made a documentary, an award-winning documentary, about his parents' story. His parents were survivors of the Holocaust and were in concentration camps. And he has recently done another film called Bunny about a New Jersey 99-year-old woman and her life story. Welcome. Thank you, Natasha. So I love that you're a documentary filmmaker about people's stories because... What's better than people's oh, stories? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing I think I really wanted to talk to you about today, because we've run your documentary, Only a Number, Yes. Uh, about your parents, and based on your mother's diaries, and thank yes. God she wrote them. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've run the documentary, and you've been interviewed before, but I think what really has me, the questions I want to ask is, you're a generation down from being a Holocaust survivor. Second gen, yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, there have been tons of studies done, but you don't come away unscathed. No. So <coughs> I think I'd like to ask you, growing up, what was your experience of being the child of a Holocaust survivor? Did you hear the stories? Did you feel compelled to live a different life because of that? Yeah, well, I, I, it definitely had uh, an impact on uh, me and uh, uh, throughout my upbringing. Uh, first and foremost, the Holocaust explained a lot about my family and, uh, and my parents in particular. So it explained why I didn't have grandparents. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of my friends growing mm -hmm. up, you know, had grandpa and grandma and I didn't have that. So. Um, it also explained why other family members were lost. It explained certain attitudes and behaviors of my parents and certain fears that they had. So um, how did you see that, like the attitudes and the fears? Well, I think, I, I think what I saw you know, growing up is when you reach a point uh, and you're uh, coming of age and want to just sort of be a little um, uh, independent. My parents were very overprotective. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was one of those survivors who was very reluctant to talk about his experience. Mm -hmm. He lost a lot. He was in camps for a period of five years coming from Poland, uh, being the first country to be invaded. Um, and uh, so he was very silent, but he was very uh, overprotective of uh, my sister, myself. Um, and my mother was um, uh, a, a little bit less overprotective, but still um, they would tend to shy away from uh, attendance in public places and, you know, mm -hmm. like large gatherings of people because of all of the roundups that they had experienced mm -hmm. in, uh, in their time. Um, came time when I was uh, early teens and I, I wanted to go to a concert. I was living in the Bronx at the time in uh, New York and, um, and uh, the concert was in Manhattan at Madison Square Garden and uh, a couple of my friends were going and there were a couple of, you know, big name groups that they were going to see. And, um, and I asked my parents if I could uh, go and, uh, you know, and I had money for the ticket and sure. everything. And, yeah. But um, they didn't want me to go because I had to take a train. And, you know, trains wow. played a huge part in uh, all of the transports that they had endured. And they were very fearful of uh, trains. And uh, they didn't want me to endanger myself by, you know, taking a train ride. So that was, you know, a lot of wow. psychological yeah. impact on them that was then transferred to me. Um, did you go to the concert? I did. <laughs> I did. Did you take a train? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did with my friends. Yeah, Were you I, afraid? Uh, uh, no, no, I, I wasn't. So that the fear didn't transpose mm -hmm. to me, but you know, I, I became more understanding of the things that. Um, uh, were of concern to them because of their history. Right. Food also was was the all important because they spent so many uh, months and years and you know starvation Starting. and just having you know bread and water once a day or something and uh, while they were in the camp. So um, food was you know there there always had to be you know a sufficient amount of mm. food and. Um, I remember later on when my son was going to college and we came for a visit when my parents were in Florida, um, 
my uh, my mom and dad had prepared this big care package, you know, for <laughs> stuff for my son to take back. Yeah. And, and when um, uh, when we left uh, their home and we were on our way to the airport, uh, they realized we hadn't taken the box of food. And my dad, at the time, was well into his seventies, and um, and uh, he actually chased after us to get to the airport. And and ran with this box of food to get to the gate of the plane, and then they wouldn't let him on because of security oh, reasons no. or whatever. And uh, and uh, and that, but that that's how that was like so important. It's how not like my son was going to starve. Yes, it was just yeah. you know. So that's something that really followed them through uh, through their life yeah. and uh, had an impact on me. I think. Yeah. You know, I was doing some research, and you know, it's it really there is this transference on many levels. And for some, more than others, depending on how the parents react. Because for some parents, they withhold a story. Uh, but th there was this case where uh, someone was having terrible nightmares of being in the camps and whatever else. But they had never been in the camps. It had been their parents who were in the camps. Mm. But they were suffering from these nightmares. Interesting. I've yeah. heard of that, actually. Yeah. And a lot of different studies in the ways that, you know, things had, had you know, had an impact. I, I think, you know, for, for me... One of the things was, uh, I call myself a humanist because um, uh, I think a large part of that uh, came from my parents. I was always one, even as a, a young child, I was always one to uh, sort of, uh, you know, root for the underdog. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other kids, uh, if they came from a foreign country and, um, and, and they came to this country and they were in school with, you know, this class of people who were, they mm -hmm. were very different from, and people would shun them, mm -hmm. and, and I would befriend them. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, part of it was because of what my parents experienced yeah. and then transferred uh, yeah. to me. So that it was important for me to... Um, uh, to form relationships and friendships with people yeah. who normally would be uh, turned away. It's interesting that you say that because my parents were not survivors of concentration camps or whatever, but they were immigrants. And I always had that affinity for seeing someone struggling with a language or right. whatever. It's just this draw toward them as opposed to away from them. Definitely. But, uh, you know, I uh, was reading about some woman who wrote about her legacy being the daughter of Holocaust survivors who had been extraordinarily heroic in their actions. And she said that she felt, she and her sisters, once they kind of explored it, felt like they could never measure up to that kind of heroic behavior and so they always kind of underachieved as a result of that hmm. that their identity got created in opposition to that right. and also this whole thing about making up for you know what your parents lost so does any of that resonate for you yeah it's interesting um uh, i would say to the to the degree where um i i i didn't feel uh, I was an underachiever or anything, but um, uh, I did look at my parents as heroes. I've mm -hmm. often said that uh, when uh, you know when kids were growing up in my era, you know the you know, Superman was a hero or mm -hmm. Batman was a hero, or, um, you know fictional heroes. But um, uh, I never had a look further than my parents. I mean, I I knew uh, and found out at an early age what they had experienced and what they had gone through. And my mom would share stories many many times with my sister and I. And uh, how when she met my father and uh, what a resourceful man he was and the things that he did, you know, while they were in camp and, um, uh, and obtaining extra food and, you know, giving it to my mom. And uh, when they were uh, actually uh, on the train at the end, before they were liberated by the U.S. Army, uh, the train had stalled because of bombing that happened, uh, you know, on the tracks. And... Um, the uh, Nazi soldiers that were guarding the train had taken uh, my dad and a couple of other prisoners into a nearby town to get food for the soldiers, not for the prisoners. Right. And um, they went to a bakery and there was all this fresh bread that had just been made. And my dad ended up putting like loaves of bread down his pants when they weren't looking. And right. he brought that back to, the, to right. share with the other prisoners and things. So, you know, there were a lot of um, uh, heroic things that uh, both of my parents uh, did to save themselves and to save each other. And um, uh, so I always looked at them as, as uh, heroic in that mm -hmm. sense. Never felt like I was falling short. But... The interesting thing for me is uh, I think 
my my passion for wanting to share their story mm -hmm. I think came from my mom in my mom's diary uh, n not so much in the film but in her diary uh, she says people often asked her how did she sustain herself how did she survive the beatings and the torture and the starvation and um, and she said you know sometimes I think she never lost her faith in God which is another interesting thing some some many did sure um, uh, she did not and she said you know she said I, I was always you know thanking God and and talking to God and I I think that I survived just so that I can tell about it and wow. I, I always looked at the irony of my life is like, if not for the Holocaust, would I be here? You know, mm -hmm. what are the chances that a, a, a man from a small village in Poland mm -hmm. would meet a s woman from a small village in Hungary mm -hmm. and uh, get together and have me? Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I always looked at it as, you know, gee, maybe that's become and in a way it has a little bit of my purpose in life is to share that story and to educate people about it and that's one of the main reasons why I made the documentary. Mm. Did the documentary resolve anything for you? Um, I don't know I don't know if it resolved anything but I mean I definitely felt um, changed mm -hmm. if you would when I came back from Europe after making the film and I had uh, I had read many many books mm -hmm. I had visited many websites and taken virtual tours of the camps and so I, I mean I had a lot of knowledge but nothing could compare with being there and having my mom's words rolling around mm -hmm. in my head as I was literally walking in their footsteps at mm -hmm. places like Auschwitz-Birkenau or Waldlager where they met or and was um, it hard for you it was hard. It was overwhelming, uh, and um, there were times when it would affect my focus. And I mm. had my uh, good friend and director of photography, Gerardo Puglia, who was also very affected. He was familiar with the story, and you know we've known each other for over twenty years. And mm -hmm. uh, Gerardo was actually one of the people that said to me, "You must make this film. You must tell this story." Mm. And um, so I, I think the effect on, on me was great and uh, overwhelming. A lot of times in the film you're seeing me and I may look a little stiff or, mm -hmm. and it's just because I was just overwhelmed and, mm -hmm. and speechless at, uh, at what I was experiencing there and finding all of these remnants of the past in the present. So I came back, I think, uh, changed. Um, I, I, I mean, I think I was always, um, uh, a bit of a humanist and mm -hmm. uh, always in in touch with uh, the priorities in life right. and what's important and the importance of family so I think that was instilled uh, in me early on right. but when I came back um, I think it um, just affected me in the way where you know people are very often you know we complain about it like it's human nature right you complain about yeah. the slightest little mm -hmm. thing if it's not cool enough or it's too right. high or if the coffee is <laughs> not sweet or the, you know I mean right. and um, uh, so I think in that sense uh, that stuck with me it's just like right. what people have endured and survived uh, yeah. really makes uh, you know everyday problems uh, yeah. you know, secondary and, and it's interesting because uh, in reading about it, one of the things I did discover, and again, it's extremes, you know. So it's, for some people, there's an immediate reminder of, oh my God, what do I have to complain about? But five minutes later, that's gone. Right. So uh, I'm assuming that this kind of experience, it kind of stays with you. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I read was, you know, children growing up in, in these families where they felt they had no right to complain about anything ever. So they really suppressed a lot of their own self-expression right. because they felt that, you know, they, they had no right. So it goes yeah. a lot of different ways, you know, the right. impact. And I suspect oh, sure. it's also how the parents report about it and or not report about it. Um, did your parents ever go back? No. Uh, they chose not to go back. I had uh, aunts and uncles who did go back, um, but my parents never expressed the desire to go back. And, and that's an actually another thing, another, another way that it affected them mm -hmm. is uh, they were never travelers. I mean, home. 
since mm. their home was taken away from them, home was the be all end all of their life. So mm -hmm. they didn't go out to restaurants for you know mm -hmm. for dinners, or they didn't never took vacations or traveled anywhere, even in, within the United States. Wow! And um, uh, they certainly had no desire to go back to Europe because they uh, they just had lost too much, and it would be too painful. Of an experience, my mother did um, uh, many years uh, later. Uh, uh, she did uh, take a trip with her brother to go to Israel to see the two sisters that she hadn't seen in, mm. you know, at that time, 25, 30 wow. years. You know, so. Uh, but that was the only trip that, and my father didn't go. You know, he was mm -hmm. in business at the time and everything. So. Is your father still alive? Yes. Uh, my mom passed away in January of 2012, mm. and my dad, uh, uh, this past February, passed his 93rd birthday. Wow. And his health is not great, but mm -hmm. um, uh, he's got a host of conditions, and he has a lot of home care that's necessary. But since my mom passed away, he's been uh, living with me here in New Jersey. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, there were some other questions I wanted to ask you, and of course, I um, could, yes, they were talking about how um, the more pathological families are described as tight little islands in which children come into contact only with their own parents, with their siblings, with other survivors. In such highly closed systems, parents are fully committed to their children, children are overly concerned with their parents' welfare, both trying to shield the other from painful experiences. Now, somewhat it, true, I think. <laughs> it sounds, but you know, the fact is that in most families we do that in some way or another. We carry our yeah, history with us. I, we try to make sure our children don't experience the negative experiences we experienced. How did you parent your children in terms of in relationship to, you know, your legacy? I think it I, well I, you know I think there's I think there's some uh truth to uh, what you read um uh I would say it's pretty common among uh parents or uh you know good parents mm -hmm. I mean you know sure. are, are you know very careful and protective with their children and they don't you know who wants their child to experience anything bad you know yes. they only want the best for them and um so um uh, I I think for my parents um, as I said before they were more protective or mm -hmm. whatever I, I maybe because of that I was a little more um, <laughs> the other liberal and I went liberal. I didn't go the other extreme I wouldn't right. say it would extreme but yeah. I was probably a little more understanding and and uh, you know my wife is uh, is not the child of survivors and um, and uh, so she didn't have some of that same personal history right. you know that I had and uh, her parents were both American and uh, you know things were you know I guess more liberal than you know right. than my parents yes. were so maybe maybe she was an influence but I think together we just right. Uh, um, became the parents that, uh, that, that, you became. that we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, I was telling you before the show, but I want to talk about it now, that, you know, I watched the documentary, and, um, and I found it extraordinarily compelling. As I said to you on the phone, uh, you know, there were times I could barely breathe, mm -hmm. but not in the sense of you weren't, you didn't create a barrage of these horrific pictures or yeah. whatever. The really, it comes through your mother's story, and then you hear one event after another, and you go, oh my God, and after this, there's, there's something else, you know? Right. And, uh, but it is done so well that Thank it you. becomes very real, and, uh, but not in a devastating way. Right, right. Uh, but I wanna ask you the question because, and I know there's no answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know, we always say, you know, we have to make sure we don't forget. And um, so I guess for me, the question that I grapple with is forget what specifically, because clearly we've forgotten everything. If you look around the world, there's no lesson that we've learned that has lasted us. Sad but true. Yeah, uh -uh. so what is it that that compelling statement of we mustn't forget, forget what specifically? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I serve on the advisory board of the Holocaust and Genocide Center in, uh, at Mercer County Community College. And, um, and uh, I, you know, I think part of my um, uh, purpose of uh, sharing the story 
is not to, you know, this may not sound right. It, it, it's not that I'm uh, contributing to not forgetting the Holocaust, but it's, it really comes down to the danger of prejudice and hatred. Yes. That's really what it comes down to. So if the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it does, needs the reminder mm -hmm. of what can happen, mm -hmm. and, and you know, that goes all the way from the things uh, you know, that are happening around the mm -hmm. world today as a result of hatred and bias and prejudice. And you know, hatred, prejudice breeds suspicion, breeds violence. Hatred and, and violence. Breeds, and you know, and, um, and this is what we're uh, seeing you know, all the time. And um, so uh, I think those are the, the, the lessons to be learned. And it's not just from the Holocaust. I mean, there's the Armenian. Genocide. You can look at Darfur. You, I mean, there. Uh, you, we could s stay here for hours talking yes. about all the incidents. So I'm going to uh, interrupt you here because yeah. clearly, again, there is no answer. Yeah. Uh, but I keep looking. This whole idea of, um, I think, I, I like that idea of. We look for where we're losing our humanity, for where we're excluding people and ostracizing people and yeah. making them the enemy. Yeah. And. Um, but we never seem to be learning our lessons. So mm. then the question would be is, okay, we can't forget, but what are the signs along the way that are reminders to us right. that will propel us into thinking differently or taking different actions? Right, right. I think that, I mean, you know, the signs become uh, apparent sometimes too late. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think the, the goal should be to uh, to share these stories, to participate, and to be an upstander. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Paul Winkler, who we just lost uh, uh, a week ago, uh, was the executive director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. And um, in many meetings, uh, the museums that are around, the, you know, everybody is sort of widening their scope because of what's been happening mm -hmm. in the world. So it's it's a, it becomes about uh, you know, not just the Holocaust or not just the mm -hmm. Armenian genocide, but what are the common patterns? Mm -hmm. Whether they're political, they're social, they're economical, mm -hmm. and that's those are the situations where sometimes it's all three, and there's this, you know, hotbed of um, uh, you know that breeds this resentment or hatred for a particular people, and so it's it's the people that need to be upstanders mm -hmm. as uh, dr winkler used to say and um, uh, and uh, you know where you see it wherever it exists and even down to bullying that mm -hmm. you know we're experiencing in schools and online bullying and things and like that and you know it's i'm That's, going to interrupt you here because yeah. I, I interrupt interviewed away i talk yeah. a lot so <laughs> i interviewed this uh, the executive director of nj um, new jersey coalition against sexual assault and so they talk about bystander intervention, t yeah. teaching people how to do that. I also interviewed uh, this Canadian guy who was a um, white Aryan supremacist and ran a hate line. And, um, you know, so he's, he now has an organization called Life After Hate. But um, I said to him, is there anything along the way? And he has a story. You could see where it happened, you know, mm -hmm. the things in his youth and whatever else mm -hmm. had happened along the way. Um, and I said, was there anything along the way that you could have, somebody could have said or done that would have altered that course once you were in it? And he said, probably not, because they gave me something that he, that was so valuable, and that's identity and belonging. And so you look at any of this, it really seems quite simple. Identity and belonging, mm -hmm. belonging, like we belong to each other mm -hmm. as opposed to, so, and you know, again, if you, if you look at it, uh, you could teach that in school. And, and they've, you know, they've done studies where there's now uh, kids entering college and they're tested for empathy and their level of empathy is like down 65% or whatever. So, Again, I, you know, there are the signs. We see the signs everywhere. Mm -hmm. We see the history everywhere. And the planet looks the way it looks because of the thinking of seven plus billion people. So again, it, it's like, how do we alter that thinking? We're trying. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, you know, and I admire what you're doing because it really is one person at a time. Right. Mm -hmm. Having an impact and telling your mother's story and, right. you know, uh, 
But I, yeah. well, even in uh, in uh, Bunny, I mean, uh, you know, at the end of Bunny, I mean, she has a wonderful philosophy of life. You know, it's about being you kind. Know, being kind, right? So kindness, respect. Yeah. Right, and uh, so she had it, and I mean, she had no background in the Holocaust. Her husband was yes. a World War II uh, Purple Heart winner, but yes. um, but uh, you know, she uh, grew up. Her parents were you know far into this country, so she observed a lot. But I mean, here's this woman who's uh, 99 and uh, still uh, still communicating that you know that yes. it's about kindness respect love and that's what it is you know you learn you know people are, people learn to hate you know yes. you don't intrinsically hate that's you know, right you're taught to hate yes and uh, so if we can nip that in the bud yeah. then maybe that's a good start because people who are you know radicalized now they're talking about you know with ISIS and these horrible things that are happening around the world. I mean, uh, these people are uh, indoctrinated and taught to hate. Yeah. So your documentaries really teach humanitarianism. That's right. We Humanism. want to teach to love. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. We're all no. part of the same. Uh, yes, <laughs> same and I race appreciate and you know we're we're almost at the end of our time, but oh. I I want people to know where they can find your documentaries, how they can get in touch with you. You know, your website and everything else will be running at the end. But sure. what do you want people to know to? see your documentaries? And well, uh, they can uh, visit uh, arijo.com, A-R-I-J-O-E.com, and I have examples of the documentaries that I've done. Uh, there's only a trailer for Only a Number on there, but they could go to onlyanumber.com and uh, always uh, order a DVD if they're so inclined. And they can um, contact you to tell their stories. And they can contact stories. me to tell their story. That's the important thing. One of the best things that uh, I'm uh, uh, doing as far as putting my passion into is helping people tell their stories. And everybody has a story. And uh, I just love uh, helping people capture, preserve, and share their personal life stories. So yeah. that's what they can do. And they you can, do it well. Thank you. They can write me at steveb at arijo.com. That's great. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.